Okay, so I was originally planning on presenting <laughs> um, sort of a lot of geoarchaeological data from two sites that I originally gave as an hour-long talk, and as I was preparing it, I decided this probably wasn't going to happen <laughs> because there was too much data. So I decided to start with a question that Soren <laughs> asked me, he was sitting there, um, when I presented all the data from the two sites in Aarhus, um, and he asked, can you um, identify if there is a geoarchaeological signature so that sort of defines what is urbanism? So I thought I would use this to sort of theme the, um, sort of theme the data from the two sites. So these sites um, that I will talk about, these are Riga, which is the modern um, capital of Latvia um, and is a UNESCO World Heritage Site, and Raymond Sulchester in the UK. So both sites are on frontiers, um, which we can sort of loosely define as the spaces across border, borders, which are dynamic zones of mobility and acculturation. And they allow us to examine the catalyst for urban development. Um, the geoarchaeology in particular helps us to understand how the cities develop in frontier zones and to what extent the uh, structuring and the range of activities um, that take place in towns are an exp expression of a sort of controlled process of urbanization. So what do these two sites have in common? So we have um, one site that's a really sort of bustling um, modern city, a UNESCO World Heritage Site, and then we have another that is just sort of doesn't exist anymore and is in a field in Berkshire. Um, well, both have um, Iron Age origins. Um, they both have an Iron Age settlement below. Um, Silchester was on the frontier of the Roman Empire in the southeast corner of Britain. And Riga, um, the establishment of Riga, is synonymous with the Livonian Crusades in the Baltic. There are some differences. Silchester was abandoned and is now a sort of what we call a greenfield site. Um, Riga is a major urban center. And the way the sort of data has been, the data have been acquired is also quite different. Um, Silchester was a research excavation um, run by the University of Reading and also a field school. Whereas the excavations in Riga were carried out um, by a commercial company ahead of development. <coughs> so just to show where Silchester is. Um, the excavations at Silchester have allowed the town to be studied from beginning to end, um, providing a snapshot of town life from the late Iron Age period all the way through to the early medieval period. Um, the, at the Iron Age town was the political territory, was in the political territory of the Atribates tribe. Um, in about AD 44, um, we have the conquest of Britain in AD 43, but from about AD 44 onwards, you see signs of a military presence, but there's no military buildings, um, just artifacts. We then see a sort of program of road, road building. Um, so we have roads built across Iron Age buildings. And then there is a sort of first major phase of buildings um, from the sort of Roman period. However, these buildings, they don't conform to the Roman street grid. So it's a bit sort of anarchic. <laughs> they sort of keep the Iron Age orientation. And then it's not until the third century AD where you have a second major phase of buildings that the buildings are then aligned to the Roman street grid. Fifth century, um, the formal administration of Rome ceases, and the sort of town sort of falls into decline. We have dark earth deposits forming, um, and 
sort of buildings sort of robbed away, this sort of thing. And at that point, the town sort of falls on a, another frontier. So it's a frontier town at its beginning and its end. So it falls on the early medieval Wandsdyke frontier. Um, so you have Wessex to the south and Mercia to the north. Uh, this just shows where the excavations took place. So there have been excavations in 1809 at the top. And these went on for several years, between 1997 and 2014. And then there have been more recent excavations in Insula 3. So the excavations in Insula 9, um, these started in 1997, I suppose, when geoarchaeology wasn't really routinely applied. Um, I did my PhD research, and it sort of wasn't really until then that we started doing um, techniques such as micromorphology, for example, and geochemical analysis on sediments. So this sort of meant that we sort of missed the later um, phase of the town in terms of the sampling. However, we've managed to sort of get it in Insula 3, which is not very far away. So this has allowed us to look at the dark earth deposits and the later occupation. So the other site that I'm going to talk about is Riga, which is here. Um, and this fits within the framework of the Livonian Crusade. Um, so between 1198 and 1290, and Riga itself was founded in 1201. So if I go back and start with Silchester, um, sorry about all the text, <laughs> the geoarchaeological data um, from sort of internal spaces at both um, sites has allowed um, the spatial organisation of activities to be studied um, both spatially and chronologically at high resolution to sort of look how the inhabitants' lives changed as a result of political change. And the geoarchaeology has been instrumental in both sites in looking at resistance to change and the retention of traditions harking back to the Iron Age, for example. So at Silchester, um, we were able to look at urban life from the, from the Oppidum through to the Abandonment. And the geoarchaeology from the Iron Age period is actually really boring. <laughs> um, <we've done laughs> it is really boring. We've <laughs> I've <laughs> looked at the geoarchaeology from the pits and there's just nothing in them, just like gravel. Um, there's no bone, there's no ash, there's no bits of pottery. There's larger um, sort of fragments of pottery, so where something's been smashed and thrown in. But in terms of the micro refuse, there's, there's just nothing there, probably because there's not really any people there. <laughs> so um, so this, it's quite quiet at this point. This sort of gradually changes through time. So um, I've just finished some work on what we call period one, which is around just around the conquest time, just before conquest. And you still have these sort of buildings um, with central halls like you have in the Iron Age. Um, it's very sort of domestic in their use, very multifunctional spaces. So everything going on in that building around the hall. And we have the use of mats as well, which is nice, because um, it's not something you see in the later phases. Um, so after conquest, uh, the sort of tradition persists um, with this, uh, sort of ac these activities around the central hearth. And then there's a gradual move away um, sort of from this Iron Age tradition um, with separate rooms added and the separation of space. So different buildings used for different activities. So these are some of the buildings from what we call period um, two and period three. So um, around 70 to 150 AD. Um, and the ones that I've circled are the most interesting buildings. The red dots within them are the hearths. 
So you can see the one at the top, which is called ERTV1. That started off as a single room structure um, with all the sort of activities taking place. The brown sort of the, the brown patch um, for room two, uh, that is um, lots of trampled material. So that's where the doorway was, which wasn't visible from the superstructure, even though you can sort of see it's cut. That was actually a Victorian trench that, um, where the Victorian excavators had just truncated it. That wasn't actually the doorway. The doorway was um, identified using microstratigraphy. Um, so we have this sort of single room structure, the activities taking place around the hearth, and then um, a new sort of room, room one, is added at a later date. ERTB8, you can see here, again, that's quite a dynamic structure that also started off as a single, a single room and it has a, a post hole structure, an earlier Iron Age structure below it. And all these buildings start in a similar way. Um, you can see here we have a roundhouse, <laughs> um, still into the Roman period. So this is the annex here. Um, and this is in section through the profile of the annex. And here you can see this is an opus signinum floor. Opus signinum in the rest of the empire is just like a sort of bog standard um, mortar. It's nothing particularly special, it's used in walls. Um, it's just it's just a functional material, but here it's used in this sort of early sort of building on the fringes of the empire. It's seen as quite special, and it's used as the floor, um, and it's kept very clean during its use. So there's no build-up of refuse between this deposit here and this earthen floor that's used as a replastering afterwards. This then sort of falls out of use. And so go from going, starting off having this nice sort of open signinum floor, <coughs> then going to have this earthen floor. It then has this big dump of recycled floor, latrine waste, um, bits of tile, just used as a leveling deposit. And this covers um, the sort of beam slot here. So a very much a, a complete change in use for this building. And it has bits of phosphatized bone, all sorts of stuff in it. So it's no longer the nice, clean annex that it once was. And you can see the outline. This is the outline of ERTV1 here. And the main focus of the habitation is now shifted here. And these are the floors of the new building. And overlying what was once ERTV1 is just loads of trampled um, dung. So it's now used as an area where animals are kept. And it has all these sort of laminated clay coatings, which is being able to sort of look at these on a, an open area excavation has been quite handy because they can be quite hard to understand their origin and difficult to interpret but being able to look at them spatially I've sort of tentatively been able to look at open spaces or semi-open spaces um, that might exist so where you have um, sort of clear floors um, inter internal spaces you don't tend to get where you don't get these sort of micro laminated clay coatings. However, in this space here, um, with all this latrine waste and trampled material, um, where it's a bit more sort of open, you've, I've started to get these micro laminated clay coatings, which led me to the interpretation that this is not a roof space or a semi open space, for example. So we've also looked. Um, at the XRF geochemical data. And this has been plotted spatially. So you see the alignment of the buildings here. 
and this is the grid side. So this building is ERTV1 at the top, um, this one here is ERTV8 at the sort of bottom right. This is copper, this is zinc, lead, strontium, phosphate and calcium. So you can see there's quite a lot of variation between the buildings. And this is after the conquest period. This is where you start to see the separation um, in the use of space. So yellow is low, <laughs> and then the sort of darker black colors are high. Um, so this one here, for example, this is over 1,000 ppm of copper in that building there. So this is sort of what we would say, this half, it's from a half, the red dots are hard. Um, so probably had some sort of metal working taking place, copper alloy metal working taking place on that half. You've also got high zinc. Um, and this building, you can see the phosphates. This is a really quite a dirty, unclean building, particularly compared to um, some of the other buildings. And you can see it here and all the sort of geochemical signatures. You've got the phosphates appearing um, in that building there, which are probably leached through the profile because you have the later stabling deposits directly over it, and I think they washed through the profile. Um, but these sort of these sort of differences in the buildings are also visible in the micromorphology. So the micromorphology from ERTB8 um, is just packed full of dump deposits. There's just dumps on top of each other. Um, rake out material from the halls left around them. So it wasn't a clean building, um, unlike some of the others, particularly ERTB1. So moving across, <laughs> across Europe um, to the excavations of Riga, these were carried out um, by a commercial company. Uh, the people who took the samples had never taken any environmental samples before. <laughs> However, they did a very good job um, and they sampled absolutely everything. So, so we arrived to work one day and opened the office door and there was a, a mound of wall of soil waiting for us <laughs> that had just been piled <laughs> in its bags in the office. So, and they also collected micromorphology samples, which I still have to look at. Um, however, we have processed the geochemical data, and there's been lots of archaeobotanical data collected as well from the site, and zoarch data as well. So, this is the plan of the modern town, and the yellow circle it represents where the, um, the former. Um, live village was. This is the, uh, the Iron Age settlement. And this is incorporated into the modern town. And that's where the excavations took place. And the excavations took place between 2011 and 2012. Um, and the archaeology was absolutely fantastic. There were loads of um, superimposed buildings on top of each other. Um, timber framed, we had latrines, um, really fantastic preservation of the stratigraphy. Um, the building techniques were also um, indicative of um, sort of indigenous um, live, uh, techniques from the live village, and there was a virtual absence of imported material culture, um, which sort of strongly suggests that this, this is this was the area of the live village. So these buildings here, these are building 17 is the earliest building that we have dated in Riga. So this is dated to 1209 um, and Riga was founded in 1201. Um, and what these results show are very sort of separate separate use of space between buildings so building 15 and um, th these are the geochemical results 
you can see we've got very high concentrations of lead, um, copper, so PB is the lead, and that's sort of over 3,000 times um, the background geology, so around the site, which is pretty high. <laughs> um, it's also 120 times the average for the site. So I took an average across the site as well, just because I wanted to see what it was like um, anyway, just across the site. Um, and I also looked at in relation to the background. Copper was also enriched, but um, not as much as lead. So I also, once I got the XRF results, I wanted to put them through the ICP to look for things like tin, silver, and gold. Um, I found silver in, in this building. This is around 47 times the background. So these, these are deposits around hearts, um, which again shows some sort of lead alloy working. And just outside in this area here, um, we had a big dump of burnt bone, <laughs> but burnt bone, and it was calcined bone, but of strange parts of the animals. So like their horns and <laughs> hoofs and the, from arthritic animals as well. So the parts that you don't really want. So the old animals were, and arthritic animals were sort of used as fuel. Um, so um, probably for, um, to get the high temperatures required for metal working. So we have the high te um, the metals in the building and then the sort of dump of fuel outside. And there's also a comparison of this from around the Novgorod area as well. Um, in comparison, the other buildings are pretty sterile in terms of their geochemical enrichment. There's not much going on in those at all. No significant geochemical enrichments. And these two buildings overlie the ones that I've just shown. Um, and this theme of clean buildings and sort of dirty spaces sort of persists through time the sort of juxtaposition of the two buildings next to each other. So we have, um, so here we have lead, also very high, um, a thousand times the background around that half. The half is in the middle here. And I then looked in the ICP, at the ICP results, and we had tin that was over 2,000 times the background. So some sort of pewter working taking place on this hearth. And I've done some experimental work looking at the geochemistry signatures um, in sort of experimental buildings in the UK. And what you find is in the primary place of metalworking, the, the soil residues um, of the elements are very high, but this signature drops off very quickly. So even within a couple of metres away from that initial point of metalworking, you no longer get these significant enrichments. They're a, they're a bit enriched, you know, perhaps 10, 20 times the background, but nothing, nothing like the primary place. Um, and also, this was a very sort of dynamic space, a dirty space as well. We have loads of sort of fish bones, fish processing waste, and huge dumps of animal bone outside the building, um, which, also, which suggests that there was sort of butchery going on, live animals were slaughtered, um, and we also have the handling of raw fish <laughs> within this building as well, with um, tapeworm evidence. So, back to the initial question to sort of sum up. Um, <laughs> is a, an urban geoarchaeological signature? Well, I think there are various factors to consider with this. Um, I think it depends if it's a Roman or medieval town. Um, the Roman geochemical data, the enrichments from Silchester, they, they're nothing compared to what we're getting from Riga, um, sort of throughout both from the sort of early period 
and the later period, even when we're getting metal working around hearths, the enrichments, they're nothing like this. Um, and the general sort of enrichments across the site are nothing like what we find at Riga. So there's probably a difference between whether it's a founded Roman town and, or a medieval town in terms of the activities that are taking place. It probably depends on the status of the settlement um, and the range of activities that take place, um, the size of the settlement and the concentration of the population within it as well. So how packed in everyone is living, where the refuse is thrown, for example. So I think that's all I have to say. Thank you. <laughs>